we are recording. Uh, we are ready to begin. And so let me discuss just a couple of quick tech things for you. Uh, we are you, you are all on the phone line, so clearly you know how to do that part. Uh, if you are having any technical problems at all during the webinar or during the webinar, please call 631-241-3065 or Adobe Connect itself at 1-800-422-3623. These numbers are also at the bottom of your screen in the audio info box in case uh, you need them at a later point. If you have any questions or comments at any time, please enter them into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen, and we will attempt to assist you. Uh, as far as questions to the panel, we ask that you also type those into the chat box, and we'll answer as many of them as are possible in our question and answer session at the end of the webinar. You can at any time make the presentation larger by clicking on the full screen button in the upper right hand side of the slide presentation. If you click on the full screen button again, it will return to normal view. Don't worry, this does not change the screen for anyone but yourself unless you are a presenter. Please bear that in mind, presenters. And with that, I will turn things back over to Nathan. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks so much, Clayton. So again, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone uh, to the Zero Suicide Expert Panel. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I'd like to start off with a few introductions of our panelists who you see there in front of you on the screen. I'll also introduce some of the SPRC staff that we have on the line. So I'll start with uh, Dr. Julie goldstein Grummet. She's the Director of Prevention and Practice here at SPRC, and she'll be one of our panelists this afternoon. Also, we have Jenna Heiss. She's the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for the state of Texas. Thank you for joining us, Jenna. Also, we have uh, Jan Ulrich. She's the State Suicide Prevention Coordinator from Kentucky. And also, we're joined by Savannah Coleman, and she's the Prevention Program Manager from Oklahoma. So thank you uh, definitely to our panel for joining us this afternoon. Also on the line, we have um, Ellie Stout. She's the Prevention Support Program Manager here at SPRC. Uh, we have Clayton, whose voice you've already heard, and we also have uh, Zoe, who is on the line helping with uh, tech as well. So I'd like to start us off by just briefly describing what we'll cover as part of this webinar. We'll talk about uh, how uh, various GLS grants, our, our panelists included, are implementing the zero suicide approach and how they got started. We'll also talk about uh, the lessons that they've learned from implementing the zero suicide uh, approach. We'll also cover strategies to overcome common barriers to being successful in implementing zero suicide. So that's just a, a brief overview. And we'd actually like to take a moment now to give you a brief poll. So Clayton, if you could bring that up for us. And this poll is just going to give us a, a quick idea of how familiar you are with implementing the zero suicide approach. So if you could take just a moment to uh, enter your responses there. Like folks are responding. Clayton, if you want to go ahead and, and show those responses to folks. Thank you for, for uh, participating in the poll there. And it looks like, as you can see, that uh, we have a, a wide array of um, diversity there in experience with implementing zero suicide, with some folks not being familiar at all, um, all the way to some folks who are, are doing a lot of work and are very familiar. So that's good to hear. I think that um, the panelists will be able to talk to the full spectrum there of, of folks who are familiar. Uh, and definitely also we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end, which I think will be very helpful. So just before I do proceed to introducing the first panelist, one thing I'll say, which Clayton shared with us earlier, we have the chat box there. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is the panelists present as your questions come up to go ahead and enter them in that chat box um, during their presentation. Um, Ellie will actually be helping us out by taking those questions and holding them until the end. So we'll have a substantive period of time at the end for uh, us to address those questions. We'll be holding on to them. So please don't be shy and, and don't hesitate to use the chat box there as the panelists um, present. So we'll go ahead and get started here with our first panelist. Um, 
and uh, Dr. Uh, Julie Goldstein Grummet, and I'll turn it over to you with what is zero suicide. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, so I'm going to provide a brief model. It looked as if people were kind of, there were some of you who know it well, some of you who don't know it as well. So for some, this will be a review. So zero suicide, it's embedded in the national strategy. I'm going to click through. I didn't realize. Uh, we see zero suicide as transformative for healthcare settings. And as you know, goal eight of the national strategy is to promote suicide prevention as a core component <coughs> of healthcare services. And goal nine is to promote and implement effective clinical and professional practices for assessing and treating those identified as being at risk for suicidal behaviors. Now, as you know, many suicides take place <coughs> excuse me, in and around healthcare, which is why this has to be the setting in which we work and form partnerships. 40 to 50% of deaths have been within a month of a primary care visit. 15 to 20% of suicide deaths are among people receiving care in the mental health system. <coughs> excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. And 10% of deaths are among people who have been seen in the ED in the past two months. Zero suicide builds on the awareness that system-wide approaches have worked. A couple examples of this are in the Air Force, in the Henry Ford Health System. Every organizational model of successful suicide prevention and care and the pioneers of zero suicide, which really includes today's panelists, began with changes in the organization's core values and beliefs. Suicide care should be seen as a patient safety goal. While reducing suicides to zero may be aspirational, reducing suicides generally for those in your care is essential. And it really is a core responsibility of health care. So I have to thank Jan O'Rourke for letting me steal this slide from her. She really captured the essence of why and how we need to make this shift. For example, Organizations have historically thought of, of suicide as it's inevitable. We do our best, but suicides happen. And I think today we know and we really strive toward the idea that every suicide is preventable, and we have to keep that in mind in order to do this work. Often an organization's plan for dealing with somebody who talks about suicide is the idea, well, we'll just hospitalize them when they experience a crisis. And we know through research that hospitalization doesn't work. Um, it does in extreme cases, but in many cases, it just keeps the person locked up, safe for the moment, and returned right back to the community, right back to providers who need to care for them. So we have to provide productive interactions throughout their ongoing continuity of care. Jan just wrote in the presenter chat that she stole this slide from David Covington with his permission. So I want to acknowledge that. And David Covington and Mike Hogan are, have really been helping to lead the zero suicide effort on the national scene. They helped write the clinical care report, uh, clinical care and interventions task force report that really led to all of this work. The other idea is it's really not good enough to believe that if we can save one life, then we've done a good job and we can feel good about that. That's not to say that we shouldn't feel good about that because that may be good and of course it's valuable, but really we need to have the idea how many deaths are acceptable. That's why we know that some people struggle with the idea of calling this zero suicide, but what could we call it that would be an appropriate name for it? It has to be something that's provocative. It has to be something that gets people talking, like is that even possible? And while we can't fault systems for when suicides do happen, and we certainly can't fault individual clinicians, we can look to systems improvement and changes to ensure that we make our systems better and try to provide change so that perhaps we can save um, somebody else's life. This is our model. This is a framework for providing systematic clinical suicide prevention and care. <coughs> I'm going to only describe this briefly in the interest of time, but I encourage you to look at our online zero suicide toolkit, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. The red box really highlights the pieces that need to be in place in order to achieve this approach. You have to have a leadership commitment committed to safety, accountability, and transparency. If they're not willing to look at their deaths, they're not willing to look at what systems can be improved, they're not willing to look at where the system may have broken down, then it won't lead to improved suicides.
but you, suicide rates. But you also have to have a workforce, and that really extends beyond just the clinical care team, who's competent, confident, and caring. We hear from a lot of suicide attempt survivors and loss survivors how much, how important it is from the moment they call an agency, how they're treated. So we know that the entire workforce has to be prepared because you never know to whom the person might disclose their thoughts of suicide. The gray box are the components of care. You need to have a way of systematically identifying and assessing for suicide risk, <coughs> providing care that directly targets and treats the suicidality, using effective evidence-based treatments. It can't be okay to just treat underlying mental health disorders and hope that the suicide disappears. You have to treat the suicide directly. And you have to provide contact engagement and support, especially during times of acute care transitions. There also should be what we've been calling a care pathway. And we really, again, in the interest of stealing things from really smart people, stole this away from Becky Stoll with uh, Centerstone in Tennessee. They really describe them, their people who are at risk for suicide as being on the pathway. They've screened them, assessed them, and determined that they need to have a heightened sense of care and concern. And therefore, their organization describes that person, person as being on the pathway. It's essentially the protocols and the practices that define care management expectations for all persons with suicide risk. It's taught to all clinicians and it's baked into the electronic health record for best results and for quality improvement so that you can determine if there's fidelity to these policies and fidelity to the larger model. As I said, you have to have a review of data and ongoing quality improvement to determine how to continually um, improve your services. It doesn't happen overnight. We've been told by a lot of the pioneers in this. They've been at it for a couple of years now, and they've told us this: you can set a lot of expectations, but things don't happen quickly. Uh, so you can pick one or two things to really focus on, but expect that this is an entire process that can take place over several years. And even once policies are in place, they can be updated as you learn more. We have a few resources to help you get started, and anybody in the prevention support staff can also assist you in describing these pieces. <coughs> we, have an, what we would suggest you begin by creating an implementation team. This should be comprised of your, of your leadership, as well as supervisors and people who work on the ground, and somebody with lived experience, or several people with lived experience. You need to know from all different angles of your organization what will work. We developed a zero suicide organizational self-assessment. Again, this was heavily influenced by some early work that Jan Ulrich did, because we wanted to help organizations be able to rate themselves. Where are they across the different dimensions that I just shared? And then we created a work plan template that kind of mirrors the organizational self-assessment. The idea of where do you begin? What kinds of questions could you ask yourself after you've completed the self-assessment? There really isn't kind of one magic recipe to say begin here and this gives you the best outcomes. Do you decide to begin based on lower cost? Do you decide to begin on things that have higher impact? <coughs> or do you, <coughs> excuse me, do you decide to begin with things that are easiest to change? There really isn't one model for where to begin. We also have the Zero Suicide Workforce Survey. It's available online and anonymous so that you can ask us to set that link up for your uh, health organization and its workers to determine their self-perceptions around what they think about the training they've had, the skills they have, their confidence and their competence to treat people at risk for suicide. And we typically find about half the people say they really don't feel very well prepared. We wouldn't stand for that in organizations where it was a medical issue like like heart disease or surgery, we shouldn't stand for that among mental health. It's the same issue. We have to be confident, competent, and prepared to work with those who come to see us. So you did hear me say that we have an online toolkit, zerosuicide.com. We are redesigning it. We wanted to make it more interactive, have a lot more information um, about how to get started. It'll be launched at the end of February. If you go to zerosuicide.com now, which I know you've all done ahead of this webinar, um, it'll look different. It's, a, it's completely redesigned. A lot of the information that was there now will be there in a few weeks, but um, it's been shuffled around and hopefully you'll find it to be more user-friendly. And really, Zero Suicide is an evolving program. We learn from the really smart people who are your speakers on today's webinar to figure out what are the 
the new resources and tools that you need to support you in this approach, and we continually design and update them and make them available to you. <coughs> so I really want to personally thank Jenna and Jan and Savannah for all that they've taught me and let me steal and even take credit for sometimes, even though I try not to do that. They really are pioneers in this, pro in this approach, as are all of you. The fact that uh, SAMHSA changed the Cohort 9 grantees to focus on um, to focus on the idea of working in zero suicide and in transforming healthcare systems is really innovative, and that makes all of you pioneers in this work. And we hope to continue to learn from you and, and share resources that help you to do this work and continue to impact suicide in this country. So, so thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, for uh, getting us started with this conversation and giving us an overview of, of zero suicide. Um, We'll turn now to our next panelist, uh, Jenna Heiss, who's from the state of Texas, and uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. It's so good to be here. It's great to hear the overview from Julie, and welcome to everybody. Um, talking today about um, what we've tried to do here in Texas. Uh, you can see the only thing really from this first slide is my contact information is there. And also, <clears throat> to let you all know, I am um, working at the Department of State Health Services here in Austin, Texas, I'm the State Suicide Prevention Coordinator. And um, what we're trying to do is to create a statewide comprehensive suicide safer care system. And uh, the main things I want to mention here is just that to try, for us to all try to be strategic in our work. And what has helped us is to really try to think through comprehensively, you know, from beginning to end of all those uh, dimensions that Julie just talked about in the model. Um, if we choose to implement something here, how will it impact this other piece? And making sure that we've got something at each level to make the whole uh, pie work. So <clears throat> I'll just go ahead and go to the next slide. I've got about two minutes per slide, I think. So I'll try not to talk too fast. Um, leadership um, is a key place. This is kind of where we started. Um, if you cue into those arrows up at the top there, um, what I'm trying to show here is this idea of moving from <clears throat> business as usual, like Julie was talking about, in our behavioral health system, um, in our public mental health system, which is where we're implementing zero suicide in Texas. Um, this business as usual uh, to folks kind of having an aha moment around the whole concept and the philosophy and the strategies of zero suicide. Um, to a moment where they can uh, move down the scale to create organizational change and really transform healthcare like we're talking about. So we're trying to elicit a paradigm shift here in the system as a whole and uh, you know, trying to have that at each individual local site but also in the system as a whole across the state. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how we've tried to create a zero suicide culture. My uh, personal aha moment was reading the Suicide Care and Systems Framework in 2011 and looking at the recommendations from the Clinical Care and Intervention Task Force, I called the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention and asked them, can you send me a speaker on this? And they sent David Covington to speak. And he talked to all of our behavioral health directors. And that was a key moment for us because it was kind of a launch moment. Um, they got really excited. We had all of the you know, behavioral health directors across the state in the room. And they got really interested in what he was doing um, in Maricopa County, Arizona, and how we could start to replicate that here in Texas. And so that was kind of our aha moment, and that's what launched everything for us. And um, <clears throat> then we did some of these other things I want to mention here. Um, uh, we do have a state plan, of course. Um, and strategic plans can drive this process. You can start embedding zero suicide strategies in the state plan. We adopted. Uh, in 2011, the Clinical Care and Intervention Task Force recommendations as our beginning. But um, just this year, in 2014, um, we did re, um, <clears throat> rewrite our state plan, and we embedded zero suicide strategies um, in them. Another idea is to it go in leadership kind of from the outside in, so like our public face. We started embedding zero suicide language and concepts in our public awareness materials, our videos that we were producing. We have a zero suicide newsletter monthly. Um, we have an app we're creating and then our website. And then from the, outside, uh, the inside out, developing policies and procedures to embed zero suicide concepts. Um, 
and organizations and state infrastructure. We do have a state uh, policy team for zero suicide, um, made up of like our medical director at the Department of State Health Services and other people like that, where we're looking at statewide implementation of zero suicide. And then we have local implementation teams like Julie talked about. And those are, we have 10 formal implementation teams across the state right now as part of our pilot. And um, so some people will continue on as business as usual. So you have to change the practice with good policy so that those folks can be part of the zero suicide culture. And sometimes they don't even really know it. But uh, that you're able to change the whole healthcare industry that way um, with your champions, your local people that are your natural leaders that can be the main face of the zero suicide concept in organizations where you're trying to implement this. We have suicide prevention coordinators at 39 community behavioral health centers across the state of Texas, representing our 254 counties. And um, we have zero suicide implementation teams in just less than half of those right now. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and to formalize this process, we are creating an endorsement process for zero suicide, and we're calling it Suicide Safer Care Centers. And you can see there on the slide goals one and two of that endorsement process as we're trying to concretize these ideas into a zero suicide toolkit for our state. And then for workforce development, um, again, this idea of 100%, um, <clears throat> we did have those local community behavioral health centers statewide invited to apply to be part of the Suicide Safer Care Initiative here in Texas in 2012. And we had a formal um, application process that seemed to work really well where we had executive uh, sponsors buying in and having a local change implementation teams like Julie talked about. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We did do the Survey Monkey tool, the workforce uh, survey, and I highly recommend that. Um, we had 3,800 people across the state in our behavioral health centers take that survey. And um, our place that became our pilot site actually had 100% of the staff, uh, and then since then other sites have replicated that, having 100% of their staff take the survey so that we can get a real true baseline of what's going on um, when it comes to people's understanding of suicide. Um, one strategy we implemented here in Texas was to translate it into Spanish so we had increased success um, along the border with uh, the survey tool. And then we did do a post-training repeat in 2014. Um, and what we kind of said was, we're going to do the 2012 survey. We're going to train 100% of the staff in the centers that do the survey. Um, or 18 months are going to pass, and we're going to get as many people to take it as possible. Some centers were only able to get 80% of their staff trained. And then we did a post survey. And then what we were able to find out and to show, so we have proof in our own pudding in Texas now that um, the workforce results uh, showed that that uh, training helped uh, the staff to be more confident um, in their ability to um, uh, care, pe care for people uh, that are suicidal. And so um, <clears throat> after, we, we had staff say that uh, before ASSIST training, which was our intervention tool um, uh, that we used, uh, applied suicide intervention skills training. But before the, the training, staff said that they felt comfortable asking about suicide, but the rate uh, doubled of their confidence in, in engaging people, um, the feeling like they had the skills they needed and the training they needed. And so that's the slide you see kind of on the right-hand side here is, the 2014 and the 2012 results compared. Um, I'll just mention briefly some of the tools that we've used for workforce development um, are um, having 100% of the staff trained in something for suicide prevention and intervention, whether or not it's ASSIST or Safe Talk or our Ask About Suicide to Save a Life is like a QPR training. Uh, it's the best practice here in Texas that we developed. And then we also have the case approach. <clears throat> which is Dr. Shea's approach. Um, and then in the second year, we did um, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale system training across the, all of the sites. Um, and then we did uh, safety planning training with Dr. Barbara Stanley. And we're actually right now having her come down and we're doing um, some fidelity training where we're going to have people submit sample safety plans and um, have a process for replicating uh, safety planning to fidelity. Um, <clears throat> and then we've also started training in the CALM, Counseling on Access to Lethal Means, and then the CAMS, the Coll uh, Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicide. Um, so we'll go on to the next one. I'm just really worried about time. Um, you had Julie explain those really nicely so I don't have to re-explain all these care essentials. 
But when we start talking about um, what we've done in Texas to implement the different things, um, I thought it would be useful to just mention that when it comes to assessment, you know, systematically identifying and assessing suicide risk among people at all levels, uh, we are using the case approach with Dr. Shea to uh, elicit um, uh, a more real uh, and direct conversation with people at risk. Um, so those are trainings for people that are conducting suicide assessments and screenings. Um, we do have um, a universal screening tool here in Texas that's implemented across the system, our public mental health system, for children and adolescents and adults. And we have embedded into that process uh, the zero suicide questions. And we're in the process of taking the CSSRS questions and embedding those in as well so that we can have that be, again, people won't even necessarily know they're doing the CSSRS, but they will be across the state. Um, and we have been doing that um, for a year now in our uh, pilot site in Denton County. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, um, of course, everybody's having the training on the CSSRS and then also on the counseling on access to lethal means. Um, and uh, we are doing training on that as well. So everybody is having um, a, a screening and a risk assessment. Um, and then we're working on these pathways to care, as Julie mentioned, how important that is that there is uh, timely and adequate access to meet needs. And um, one thing we're doing there is uh, making sure that we have really clearly identified triage points. Again, that statewide protocol team is identifying across the state what's appropriate. Um, that will be in performance contracts and so forth for all of our providers. And then local implementation teams are also highlighting local policies around their pathways to care. So there will be the state version, which will be sort of mandated, and then there will be the local version, which will make sense within their own systems. Um, and then um, with evidence-based care, the idea of using that effective evidence-based care, we do have uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy here in Texas, and DBT, uh, though not all sites have DBT. Um, <clears throat> and that's to help effectively treat the suicidality. Again, we are using CAMS, which is the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicide Risk. We do have the online module that we're doing for that. Um, and we are looking at uh, the CBT-SP, it's upskilling and suicide prevention for uh, CBT clinicians. Because again, um, you know, you look at the low-hanging fruit, we already had a process for CBT in the state and making sure that our centers had um, you know, fidelity to that. And so uh, we're going to be adding into that process, into that training infrastructure that's already in place. Um, and making sure that we have the protocols there for how to treat the suicidality itself by using the CAMS process. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, then for follow-up care, of course, uh, very important having, uh, again, within those pathways to care, um, warm handoffs, making sure that we're really clear that nobody at risk in our system uh, flips through the cracks, that we're really clear on how we're working with this person at every step of the way uh, long after um, uh, follow-up care services, uh, sending the caring letters and texts, which we've all learned so much about in the field. Um, and we'll go to the next slide here. Sorry, I'm rushing everybody. Um, <clears throat> here uh, is some of the other important pieces. Um, that last kind of loop there of the quality-driven um, process is to use the data that you're collecting along the way to inform um, what the um, implementation looks like. So um, that's something that we're working on. You can see the example on this slide is actually of using the tool of the workforce survey. So you have your local implementation team, and you can use the workforce survey and help identify issues around provider skills and then um, provide validation to the resources that are expended on training, um, track the individuals with elevated risk, <coughs> excuse me. And so you want to employ your tool, review your data, which is what we've done, and then uh, make your system intervention and then have a way to uh, retest it and, and say, hey, this actually worked, this was worthwhile, this was worth the resources, um, this worked. Uh, like, for instance, with the workforce survey, we saw, in fact, that um, training 100% of the staff had a huge impact in our state. So um, that's kind of the idea here. Um, we're doing a lot of different things to, of course, test that. Um, looking at uh, the different data metrics, which I'll be happy to share with people uh, later. 
Um, <clears throat> and then this idea here on this slide is just in the middle here, we've got the Suicide Safer Care Center that I've been talking about, which is what we're doing in the public mental health system. But we're really hoping that that will be a model that will then work across the state. And so you'll have the center, uh, the model of the center here, and then the community will come around that with Suicide Safer Care strategies. And then ultimately, we'll have that idea of the Suicide Safer Care State. Um, and this was, uh, we don't have a lot of time to go through this, but this is our pilot site. I just thought I'd share some of the community strategies that we were using here at our model center um, in Denton County MHR, which was our pilot for our GLS grant. Um, we're in the second year of this project, and we've recently expanded to 10 other sites this year. But this pilot site, we're really seeing some exciting uh, benefits of using the zero suicide approach within the model center itself, but then also within the community at large. Um, uh, with our post vision work in the high schools, um, with law enforcement, um, we're seeing they've joined the local suicide prevention coalition that we started as a part of this. And um, they're using the same tools that I was just talking to you guys about, about the CSSRS and, and the some of the other processes. And so they're having the same trainings and the same language, and they're able to share information much more readily. And so we're seeing um, you know, just a lot of really neat and important uh, collaborations happening within the community around suicide safer care and um, you know, really creating that uh, a, a real strong means matters campaign there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and so it's very exciting to see how this is expanding out into the community and really truly you can see the, that it's truly saving lives, and that's the point. So uh, that's it for me in Texas. Thank you so much, um, Jenna. Thank you for giving us an overview of all the awesome things you all are doing in Texas. Obviously, a, a lot of wonderful things going on. Um, and before we transition to our next panelist, just a reminder that if you have questions, that are either specific to the panelists or just things that you're hearing, please don't hesitate to use the chat box there. We are grabbing those questions, and we are going to hold them for our question and answer section at the end. So now we'll uh, transition over to Jan Ulrich. Um, and Jan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm Jan Ulrich. I am the State Suicide Prevention Coordinator in Kentucky. And I've been involved with suicide prevention since 2002 when I lost my son to suicide. Um, started getting involved with some new efforts within our state around uh, looking at the state and figuring out how do we reduce suicide. And we took pretty much the same road almost every other state. We put a lot of time and effort into gatekeeper type training. We did a lot of QPR. Um, we, with our first GLS grant, we had the opportunity to do a lot of work with our secondary schools. And so we did a lot of teacher training. We got programs in for students. And, and, but one of the things that we ran into very quickly working with those schools is we were identifying, we were helping schools to be able to identify students that were at risk and even maybe get them to the counseling office there. But when it came to taking those kids and getting them into help, getting them referred, and then making sure that if they were referred, they actually were connected with care, um, we found that that was an area that there was just a, a big gaping hole. And so just like Jenna said, when I, when I read the Suicide Care and Systems Framework Report in 2012, that was my conversion moment. It was like um, this just seemed to fit the areas where we were really felt like we were just not quite getting where we needed to be. So after we decided to get involved in the Zero Suicide Initiative, we had to go back and figure out how to create some champions with our state, some, some high-level leadership champions. So part of that also became how are you going to measure whether you have success or not. And so we were able to get the go-ahead to be able to do a crosswalk with vital statistics data and our client records for our community mental health centers as well as our state hospitals. And what we got back out of that, uh, we did the first time we did this, this report, we looked at 2007 to 2012, and we found out that somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of the Kentucky suicide deaths in any given year actually had been clients of our community, one of our community mental health centers within the year or the year after that they had received services. Now, as Julie talked about, what we weren't trying to do was to create a blame environment. 
um, we wanted to make sure that this was a, a way of just figuring out where we were starting so we could figure out where we needed to go next. We also wanted to look at our individual clinicians and say, well, you know, where do they feel they're at? Where do they themselves feel they're at? And what can we do to help there? And so we worked at the time in 2012 with David Covington and did the behavioral health care workforce survey. And just as Jenna said, I strongly urge that you look at that. To be able to figure out uh, where you're at, we found out about half of our behavioral health clinicians, we, we surveyed about 3,000 around the state, didn't feel like they had the training they needed to engage in the those with suicidal desire and or intent, about 43%. Uh, didn't know if they had the skills, and about a third said that they weren't sure that they had the support or supervision they needed. And so this gave us uh, really a, a, a place that we could get started. Um, we had had a couple of laws passed in Kentucky um, really looking at our survivor who were advocates in the state around school-based suicide prevention, and they were able to sort of follow the Washington state model of clinical trainings, and so that went into effect this year, starting January 1st, and now all of our um, behavioral health clinicians have to have six hours of suicide prevention training every six years. So we tried to leverage what we already had in place. Um, when, we, when that law was passed, we had our second GLS grant, and we were able to build into that the opportunity to do some trainer trainings of the Assessing and Managing Suicide Risk Program and also some CAMS programs. We had done regional trainings around the state um, bringing with our community mental health centers as partners and our regional prevention centers as partners to be able to sort of plant the idea of um, the suicide safer care and in those regions. And we had had the opportunity to do a, a great big forum where we brought David in as well to be able to bring our CEOs of our community mental health centers and our, our state hospitals and, and others around the state and their suicide prevention champions. So we were, again, trying to, to build our champions, trying to make those converge moments happen. So when we looked at what we had, we. You know, we looked at our data, we looked at our train, training, and figured out how to leverage what we already had in place with those to be able to figure out where we were going to move forward from there. We also developed an organizational readiness assessment. As, as Julie talked about earlier, we wanted to know where, where our centers were at. How do we create an improvement plan? How do we work with our centers to create an improvement plan if we don't know where they are? I can tell you that um, some, some folks much smarter than me have taken this little idea we had and really just made some awesome resources, much, much better than, than what we started with. But it gave us a place to start. We were able to embed that into our community mental health center contracts so that in the first year they had to, to go through this assessment and then they had to build some work plans off of that of how they were going to improve from there. Now the whole thing about, you know, everything always changing is, is definitely true. Um, we we had some strong leadership, and then we lost that champion. We had some other things go into place, our Medicaid expansion, some major, major budget cuts. And so we began to lose some ground. But that's something that's going to happen. You know, wherever you're at, whatever organization you're in, whatever state you're in, you're going to run into those. So you do everything you can to, to bake things in as much as possible so that you know, you have some security so that if you end up having to, to reroute, you've got somewhere that you can start, start again without having to start all over again. Um, we, with our most recent Garrett Lee Smith grant, uh, our current one, we followed the lead of Texas and we built into that the Suicide Safer Care and Suicide Safer Communities where we're, begin we're going to partner, we are already partnering with one pilot site that had really got out in front of this initiative as we launched it across the state to be able to 
look at all the concepts, the zero suicide concepts, and to be able to systematically walk through that, make, looking at their electronic health records and embedding the CSSRS into that, um, looking at their protocol and procedures, um, looking at their follow-up. They're, they're working on actually working with one of the state hospitals and doing a telehealth um, visit at just right after they're released from the hospital for a suicide attempt or for, for other issues to be able to improve that follow-up care. So that'll be really interesting and exciting to see where it goes from there. And then this is a particular group that we know will be our champions across the state. But at the same time, we're pairing this up with our regional prevention centers and, and looking at what are we going to do in the community that goes right alongside of what we're doing on the clinical side? And I think this is, this is really the first time that in Kentucky that we've been able to take this walk together. So we're really excited about where that's going to go. Um, we also have had the opportunity to get involved with the Zero Suicide Breakthrough Series. We're one of six states that are involved in that. And we're bringing our the same a community mental health center partner to the table with that. And it's really sort of propelling us ahead of looking at the zero suicide work plan. Where are we at now? Where do we want to get to? We're also involved in the zero suicide learning collaborative and part of sort of a subgroup with three other states that have been, you know, doing this for a little while and sort of in that pioneering mode. And so it's those are really exciting calls too. We've, uh, Mike Hogan is our mentor. And just in the few calls we've had already, there have been a lot to learn from where others are in the state. And so, you know, the big thing that I would say is embed what you can, um, understand that the way things are now is not the way they're always going to be. If you lose some ground, then that's okay, take heart, come back to the, this group, come back to the experts in the zero suicide area, um, back to your SPRC folks, back to your Action Alliance folks, because I guarantee you that somebody else out there has experienced what you're experiencing. Don't give up um, and take heart and thanks for doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, Jan, for sharing your experience with us and uh, also that encouragement. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, before we transition again to the next panelist, I'd just like to remind folks that we do have a few folks there using the chat box to enter their questions, either specific to the panelists or, or just general. Um, please don't hesitate to use that chat box as we uh, go in also to the next panelist. And I'll go ahead and transition here to Savannah Coleman. And Savannah, I'll turn it over to you. Hi. Okay. I hope you guys can hear, um, hopefully not my buzzing phones, but everything else. Um, so today I just want to say, first of all, it's such a, a wonderful thing to be considered an expert panel. And for anybody who is listening, who um, I noticed it was kind of like a bell curve of how involved people are with zero suicide already. Um, if this is your first time hearing about it, please do not feel intimidated by anything you've heard so far. And if this is kind of old hat to you, please just be encouraged by what um, the three of us have to say. And I want to thank Jenna and Jan. You guys are um, wonderful, wonderful colleagues to have, and I'm so fortunate to get to work with you guys on a pretty regular basis. So um, the following from Oklahoma is just a brief, uh, you'll see and, and you'll laugh alongside of me, it's really a skeleton of what um, Oklahoma has accomplished so far as it relates to zero suicide. Um, I've taken a very austere approach to my slides today. So um, leadership, uh, as you have heard already, uh, leadership buy-in and support is crucially important um, to zero suicide being successful. And so our story uh, in Oklahoma, fittingly, begins with our commissioner, the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Um, she and uh, some of our upper level directors saw a presentation by Mike Hogan, which was very similar to what um, Julie presented to you in the beginning of this webinar. 
Um, concurrently, we were reviewing internally within our treatment services uh, the death data for clients who are considered in our care. And the more you get into the zero suicide um, work, you will understand that even defining who is currently in care uh, can be tricky sometimes. And there are kind of floating definitions. But um, using our local definition of what in care meant, um, we were able to compare the national data, which suggests that about 90% of persons who die by suicide have um, a struggle with mental illness to some degree. Um, we were actually able to find out locally that around 80% um, were receiving mental health services. Um, and in large part, if you're receiving mental health services in Oklahoma, you are receiving it from the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. So. Um, our commissioner and directors were receiving presentations on zero suicide from Mike Hogan. Our treatment services were reviewing death data and identifying that um, clients were dying by suicide who were um, part of our uh, treatment, whether it was outpatient or inpatient. And then our prevention services, who had a longstanding, uh, had been multiple grantees of the Garrett Lee Smith Youth Suicide Prevention work, they were finding out that um, you know, when we go and do this work in school-based settings, uh, it was not becoming very fruitful for us to find one, say, champion teacher or one champion counselor. We were finding the most progress um, whenever we were able to find uh, a principal or a district superintendent that was really able to say, this is important, and I want to make this work throughout my system. So we had three different kind of perfect storm moments that were happening within our leadership at, at varying um, levels that were all kind of pointing us um, in the same direction. So when we were able to get together, um, we kind of started our own version of the zero suicide organizational assessment that both Jan and Julie have mentioned. And you know, we didn't really call it that. We didn't know that that was what we were doing. And we're so thrilled that this has been formalized for future generations of organizations who are um, wanting to do this work. But what it looked like for us on the ground at the time was uh, we had our clinical directors for the community-based mental health service centers in Oklahoma form a zero suicide work group. Uh, at first, it was just a place to review what is currently being assessed, what's currently being screened, um, and how are we treating suicidality. And from that, we kind of came up with the top three uh, modes of treatment for uh, clients who are struggling with suicidality. So we had an AMSR training, we had a CAMS training, and we had um, one CMHC, which was a pretty large uh, center in our state had a um, majority of their staff had received dialectical behavioral therapy. And this was just kind of the uh, vision of their clinical director had really found um, DBT to be profoundly helpful for a variety of mental health struggles. And so they happened to have a lot of clinicians who'd been trained in this um, method really intensely. Um, and then our prevention staff got to wondering, you know, um, if this was this, uh, we wondered if this was the same for healthcare proper, you know, for the hospital setting. So we started reviewing what is out there as far as um, evidence-based practice for um, getting physicians some sort of clinical training and identifying suicidality. What we currently had was a question, persuade, refer um, with room safety components. And what that meant was we uh, used the expertise of a doctor at a local hospital that had a psychiatric unit which was known for their um, emergency mental health care, um, come in and kind of add two or three slides onto our you know, basic QPR deck that talked about JCO patient safety standards and then just his own practical experience about how to um, compassionately make sure that a room is safe. Um, we found that this was really impactful in one service location where this um, medical staff person was located. They continue to teach this QPR to their new employees. But again, it really had no traction to expanding anywhere else, kind of in the same way that um, the one CMHC that was doing dialectical behavioral therapy, which is um, known to um, you know, be able to reduce suicide thoughts in clients, um, 
you know, that has, has been working well in one place, but there wasn't any traction for this to get out statewide. So we were doing our development. We were conducting our own survey of what is working well. We'd received data, and we'd received um, buy-in from our leadership at the very top level to consider what's working and, more importantly, what's not working. And I think that it was at that moment when we had the data and the organizational support, we were able to look at one another and say, the emperor has no clothes. We really are not um, equipping our workforce to be able to treat suicidality or, and or we are not receiving staff as we um, uh, get new hires from, say, you know, our uh, state wonderful state programs giving MSWs and LADCs and LPC certifications, they are not equipping um, our workforce. And then when they get to our CMHCs, uh, we are not giving them uh, training to address suicidality either. So when we were given the freedom to kind of uh, look at one another, it, it wasn't necessarily one person had an aha moment. It, I think for Oklahoma it was more like we all realized um, this is an issue, but now we're being given the ability to, to take a look and see what we can finally do about it. So um, about this time, uh, we had, uh, what, what did this look like practically? I just want to like try and pull the curtain back a little bit for some of you on the call um, to really understand what was going on so that you can feel encouraged to um, dig into this work. We had two full-time employees who were specifically working on suicide prevention, myself and um, my amazing staff, um, Julie Geddes, who's been doing this work for many, many years. Um, and that was it. So we had um, directors at uh, upper levels telling us this, we were getting the green light to be doing a lot of work, um, but we were not, um, we didn't have the practical staff to expand to all these um, new service locations. So um, at the, the moment when we had a lot of people pitching in whose job description did not include suicide prevention uh, on a normal daily basis, and when we had our two full-time employees, uh, myself and my staff, working as hard as we could to try and expand um, our reach and develop what would be systems-level approach, getting buy-in from directors and getting buy-in from survivors, um, that's when we realized we, we might be headed towards empty. We might be running out of gas here. So our state-appropriated suicide prevention funding was in question because we had a statewide budget shortfall. And we'd received for the first time ever in fiscal year 13 uh, half a million dollars uh, in a line item in the budget for uh, suicide prevention. However, uh, it was not guaranteed that we were going to receive that again. And um, it was just looking pretty bleak. And I will tell you, uh, within probably about a month, we had state appro we got word that our funding was uh, reapproved by our governor, and um, which, if you'd like to know more about the political climate of receiving money for suicide prevention in uh, Oklahoma, it's very fascinating, and I'd love to talk to you later about it. But um, at the same time, a new RFA was presented, and it was called the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. And um, uh, we didn't have time or hardly the strength to complete it, but we did. We knew the only way to um, kind of sustain the efforts and the scale that we were hoping to impact in the state was to apply for this grant, which would uh, supply funding for projects and staffing for three years. So as of um, literally Friday, we can now say that we are increased to um, five full-time employees and um, an internship program that we've kind of formalized uh, to embed suicide prevention learning into um, our central office. And we have a road map. So the next few bullets I'm going to go through quickly and um, just tell you a brief uh, overview of where the ODMHSAS is going. I will say that um, my big takeaway was getting leadership buy-in and understanding where the naturally occurring spheres of responsibility are. All that means is um, if you would consider like a cement pool that is empty, if you have uh, three walls instead of the four walls, and you try and start filling it up and saturating it with water, it's going to run out into um, the lawn, right? So you need all four walls. You need to understand who and where it is you're trying to serve and then serve those individuals and um, be really kind of disciplined about um, 
where you're hoping to impact um, your training. Sorry, let me go back. So this is our brief map, and we are sticking to it pretty quickly because um, you won't have time or resources to, um, and your impact will be lessened if you're not able to um, find an area where people can um, be responsible to, whether it's their workforce, their patients, their clients. Um, these are the things that we are um, planning on doing with this time and with this funding. So a few, moment, a few minutes here on continuation. To keep this going in Oklahoma, we've already decided that um, all current and future suicide prevention funding from uh, whether you're a subrecipient or vendor of ODMHSAS, we're going to include these core components of um, who is your um, client or patient and what is the care pathway that they're going to receive if we were to fund you. And we need evidence that your leadership is on board, whether that's a signature on an MOU or a contract. We're going to continue working towards creating uh, just a few more permanent positions. We all know that grant funding can be difficult when um, staffing a project, um, and we don't need staff for staff's sake. But um, we do believe that going beyond two persons is uh, reasonable and responsible. And we're doing that by braiding our funding with state and federal dollars um, and private funding as it's available. Um, we're going to formalize suicide prevention knowledge base into these staff and develop um, you know, uh, a, a way to springboard, hopefully, into that master's level programming and say, if the ODMH SAS has figured out how to embed what is core suicide prevention knowledge, then how can we push that upstream into those master's level um, certifications? And then we're going to coach our staff that we're going to, as a culture and as a climate, we're going to shift from what feels good to us to maybe conduct a uh, QPR every month to what is going to be good for Oklahomans 5, 10 to 20 years from now. Um, and that's really saying um, maybe we need to focus on QPR within a specific sector or a specific um, location and continue to make sure that um, those projects are ongoing rather than um, disparate you know, trainings here and there. And then we're going to measure some apples to apples. We've already mentioned we have um, a GLS, uh, NSSP state and state funding. And our Oklahoma Department of Health has funding that they receive to expand suicide prevention surveillance um, through the violent death reporting system. So we need to make sure that across those areas, we are finding at least a few key areas where we are measuring the same thing in the same way. So that at the end of the day, we can show, um, Jenna mentioned this, that our dollars have been effective and that um, we've used them responsibly and that the things that cost um, uh, money to do and time to uh, implement are, are worth their while. So again, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to be around for questions and answers, and I'm, I think I'm turning it back over to Nathan. Thank you so much, Savannah, for providing an overview of your work. That was great. Um, so now we're going to transition into a, a period of time to have questions and answers from all of you who have joined the webinar. We've been capturing a few of your questions. I would like to invite you now to use the chat box intentionally, if you haven't uh, done that yet, to add uh, questions or thoughts as we uh, progress in this conversation. And also, we did hear a few of you do have experience in working in um, zero suicide. And so as we progress, uh, please feel free to join in with the conversation with your experience as well. Um, and definitely, we, we are a, a community of learners together, so please feel free to use the chat box in that way also. So I'll go ahead and get started with a few of the questions that we have that um, have already come in. Uh, and this one is just a general question, really, for any of the panelists. Um, one individual asks, what specific training module are you using for the CSSRS? Is it the online training via Columbia University? Don't everybody answer at once. Uh, this is Jenna in Texas. We are using the uh, On the Zero Suicide Toolkit. Um, there's the module there that I believe New York did um, for suicide prevention um, for uh, uh, Dr. Barbara Stanley's work. Um, and then there's also the one for um, the CSSRS, and that's the one that we've been directing staff to use um, <clears throat> to get an orientation into the CSSRS. And then um, there's the kind of more hands-on training that's done by an administrator uh, or, you know, training specialist at the site itself where it's like how do we actually implement it and use the, the tool 
Um, so it's a, it's a face to face, uh, but it's the online one is the one that we're having people use to um, get trained and get the idea of what it is, get oriented to it. Great, thank you, Jenna. And actually, we. Uh, have someone there, Sarah, actually just added a link there in the chat box to um, what you just mentioned. So that's great. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else have any thoughts about that question? Okay, we'll transition to another question. Um, one individual asked, are there contacts you would recommend for helping to teach suicide-focused CBT? Does anyone have any contacts they would share? Okay, this is Jenna again. <laughs> um, just to let you all know, this is something that we're working on right now. The two um, <clears throat> places that we are actually um, looking into is the Beck Institute um, and who their trainers are that have the upskilling in suicide prevention. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is Dr. Barbara Stanley does do a CBT uh, suicide prevention focus treatment as well. So I can't really recommend one or the other because we're still deciding which one we're going to be using. Anyone else have any thoughts on that question? Hi, this is Savannah from Oklahoma. We have a, a really uh, great trauma in focus CBT program that we teach internally at the agency. Um, and I believe it was just launched um, to be available. But I will tell you, I cannot speak to um, suicide prevention focused CBT, so I think uh, Jenna's comments were probably much more helpful. And I think the, the reason why I say this is because um, some of you might be familiar with trauma focused CBT or have heard that, um, but I will say that uh, in people on the call can jump in, but there is a difference between suicide focused CBT and trauma focused, even though there, there can be quite a bit of overlap. So. Um, I liked that the question was specific, but I don't know that anybody will have much more than um, what is going on in the chat box in Jenna. This is Jan. We're sort of at that same place. Our department has sponsored the trauma-informed CBT program. And we, we did try when we put our different programs together and our, our uh, bringing folks together to create champions to build off of what was already there. So we have tried to to keep a tie with the, the trauma-informed efforts that actually you know were sort of out ahead of us in the state. So people didn't feel like they were starting from scratch. But we have not yet looked into um, pulling the the suicide prevention element into it. But I think it's definitely something that will be on our radar screen. Great, thank you all. And we also have um, one of the participants there also put a link in the chat box, so there's an additional resource there as well. Another question that's uh, kind of program related, um, any thoughts or opinions on QPR versus Safe Talk for, uh, or as a suicide strategy, prevention strategy? And this is, again, just for, for any of the panelists. Well, this is Jan, and I guess my question would be, who would who would they be aiming that at? Um, are you talking about clinicians? Are you talking about for you know um, families, et cetera? We had a lot of QPR training, basic gatekeeper QPR training for a long time. That was all that that was really being offered for our clinicians. But we're really um, ha having this new law in place. We're taking that to a different level and saying let's let's use the QPR or Safe Talk. We just have a lot of QPR trainings in the state and QPR trainers for those who are, are not behavioral health care professionals. And then let's look at the programs that let's invest in the programs that are really aimed at that assessment, treatment, and management of suicidality. And that's why we invested in our 34. Um, assessing and managing suicide risk trainers around the state to try to be able to give our regions the capacity to fulfill the new law uh, without having to take everybody off, you know, off the line um, and away from their clients at the same time. So we try to, to raise that up. Um, certainly the QPR 
uh, key that there are programs in QPR that are aimed at clinicians, but the QPR gatekeeper training itself, Paul, Paul Quinnett himself would say, you know, behavioral health professionals need more than the, than the QPR basic. Now, within those organizations, if you've got other staff um, that are not clinical, but maybe they're answering, answering the phone, et cetera, then yes, we would highly encourage that they get trained as well in, in an appropriate model of gatekeeper training. Thank you so much, Jan. Anyone else have any thoughts on that question? Anything to add to what Jan shared? Okay, we have one more question here, and actually this is for you, Jenna, about something that you uh, brought up. Uh, one individual asked, is the use of the term suicide safer, exclusive, or copyrighted? Um, essentially, do they need permission to use it? Um, <clears throat> the easy answer is it is not copyrighted at this time. Um, the uh, full disclosure answer is that uh, we are actually at the Department of State Health Services here in Texas. Um, uh, being asked that question um, by a couple of other entities, we've developed an, an app um, for smartphones that's called Suicide Safer Care Homes. Uh, I mean, Suicide Safer Homes, and you know, it's about locking up medicines and guns and things like that. Medicine take back, um, keeping your house, uh, you know, in that zone of being suicide safer. Um, and there are some other apps being ready to come out um, that are called Suicide Safe. Um, and so um, I, I think it's one of these things where it's not so much that we want credit for it in Texas and that idea and that concept um, as much as, you know, this is just something that's emerged in the field of all of us working in zero suicide, so we don't really feel that we own it in Texas. It's just more that we all keep, um, that what that means is it's an implementing the zero suicide model um, and that we keep that kind of pure, I guess would just be my um, wish and recommendation, um, if that makes sense to folks, that you know we don't just start calling everything suicide safer, but that that really means something, that there's a set of standards that go with that. Um, in Texas, that's going to be specifically the endorsement process for being like a zero suicide um, clinic. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully that answers that and that's not more confusing. We haven't wanted to trademark and we haven't wanted to do like going after people for trademark infringements and that type of thing. We want to share that idea and that concept with folks, but we do want it to stay kind of pure to what its meaning is and that its intention is. This is Julie, and I, I just I, I want to add to that. Thanks, Jenna, because I think what you said is so accurate. Um, I think, you know, we called it zero suicide. There was it, It's controversial. Suicide safer care really captures what it is. You, it's the process that you're actually doing, and I think it's a great um, description of, of what you're actually doing. People do um, bring people together and they don't necessarily want to have a, a training day that they call zero suicide. They want to focus in on suicide care, health and wellness, um, you know, training your clinicians, things like that. And I think that's fine. I think the flip of it is, as Jenna alluded to, is the idea that <coughs> We have to be really careful about what we call zero suicide. Zero suicide is a comprehensive approach across all the different domains that you heard described today. And it's not something that you, we can say it's done in, um, in schools necessarily or with police necessarily or in a clinic who says, well, we're going to do screening. It's part of a comprehensive approach. It's part of a feedback loop using data. and continuous quality improvement measures. It's not a one-shot deal and then on to the next thing next year. It's the idea that it, um, it's, it's embedded in the culture. It's embedded in the practices. There are a significant amount of policy changes to try to sustain the, this approach. And so I think the biggest concern is diluting it by using it if it's not applying to the model that we described today. Um, so we love suicide safer care. You know, sometimes even we'll say the zero suicide approach, colon, a suicide, a safer suicide care model. I, I, you know, I, but I do think that be very clear what you're talking about, what you're doing, and be very committed to the process um, of 
of getting through all of the dimensions. Because there's research. We saw research <coughs> that came out of um, England that there, there is, it is important to do all of the components of the model. That um, if you only do some of the components, you only get some of the results, and then you wonder why you're not successful. And so you need to implement each of the different dimensions of the model. Um, and we hope over time to be able to talk to you more about which of the dimensions of the model are most important. To be fair, we can't really say right now. <coughs> if you, you know, screening is sort of 50% of it and lethal means counseling is 40% and, you know, treatment is only 10%. You know, we really don't know what it is about the model that works, but we do know that in organizations who have really committed to this comprehensive approach from A to Z, they saw a significant reduction in their in their rates of suicides. They saw as much of a 75% reduction in their rates of suicide. So we just encourage you to be true to that model. Thank you for, for those thoughts, Julie. We have another question here um, from a participant. They would like to know uh, what challenges people are facing in their efforts to implement zero suicide. So, I think we heard from all the panelists some, some themes, and you talked about challenges a little bit, but it would be great if we'd take a moment now and describe maybe some of the challenges uh, that, you're, that you've been facing. This is Jan. I think it's provocative, as Julie mentioned earlier. Um, it, for some, is frightening, especially that our clinicians themselves, there's the fear that going to put all the blame onto the shoulders of the clinicians. And, and it really is exactly the opposite of that. It, it really is about equipping the clinician with the support, the training, the skills that, that they've already, already been needing and wanting. Um, and, and making sure that those protocols and policies go into place that are, again, supportive of what they're doing. And so, in fact, instead of putting it all on their shoulders, then it becomes a, a team approach. Um, we had some fear that, that arose after we did our crosswalk with the vital statistics data. There was um, our commissioner at the time who had given the approval to, to use it. His the first response after they, it came back was, um, don't send it, don't fax it, don't email it, don't do anything with it. And then, you know, as he processed it deeper, was able to come back and say, okay, let's, how do we use this effectively and how do we not use it to as punitive or, or punishing, but yet how do we, you know, help get those centers help? Thanks, Jan. Thanks. Um, this is Savannah, and I can also say that um, Herman, great question. Herman's on my team. Um, uh, I think that one of the things that uh, Julie mentioned that I would also just um, press forward as far as a challenge is that um, to be implementing zero suicide, and the reason why I think um, you've seen an alignment between, um, say, um, SPRC as an organization and um, uh, the NSSP, the National Strategy Aligning with Action Alliances, we are seeing real gains when zero suicide is implemented in reducing um, attempts and deaths, but to implement it is um, a, a massive undertaking. So I would say that one of the challenges we are uh, continually facing in Oklahoma is um, uh, the scope of what is being asked is that it's not just um, embedding QPR into new employee orientation at the um, Department of Mental Health. It is implementing it at new employee orientation and ensuring that now it is, um, you know, QPR is offered for every non-clinical staff every single year and that it is making sure that clinicians, both new and maybe more flexible and eager clinicians receive training in CAMS, but that clinicians who have been part of our system for 20 plus years receive CAMS and um, are able to see some new opportunities for growth professionally, which is difficult, and um, to then ask, you know, directors to be changing the way they do paperwork, even if this is the seventh time this year they've had to change the way they do intake paperwork. Um, those, those, each little component of that is, is vast and has many moving pieces, and uh, that's some of uh, what is, is difficult to 
um, continue work on in Oklahoma because just the, the scope is is large. There's a lot of moving pieces. This is Jenna. I would echo that as well. In Texas, um, right now, it was fine and well when we had one site doing it for a year for our GLS pilot, but now we've got uh, 10 sites doing it, and so you have 10 sites with 10 different challenges. <laughs> so we have, um, actually we have a learning collaborative similar to the zero suicide learning collaborative model that SPRC hosts. And we've actually split our learning collaborative into five agencies instead of all 10 to give breadth and room to have these kind of discussions about the challenges that each side is facing so that they can share it with the national experts like in a coaching format or myself in a technical assistance format or with each other as peers and hey this is our challenge for instance one of our centers um, is covering several counties and regions um, uh, down south on the border and so theirs is literally how does implementation team meet face to face when they're so rural and so spread apart so many hundreds of miles apart to all come together and um, do their implementation team work um, other folks um, you know have other challenges that they're facing um, like one one center has um, a little pushback from the psychiatrist on being hundred you know trained a hundred percent like everybody else they don't think they need it and so you know, the implementation team lead took the psychiatrist to lunch and explained why it was important, and then they got on board. You know, so just like this problem solving of the, you know, uh, that was a very urban center where, you know, they, they're highly skilled and really didn't think that they needed and didn't understand why they had to buy into this concept and do what everybody else was doing. And so it's like um, <clears throat> how to bring those people on board in Houston versus, you know, like I said, down on the border. And so just like the regional differences of implementing it in different types of centers and different, you know, some people have um, walk-in psychiatric emergency care centers and they're implementing it there. Others are in different types of settings. And so there's different challenges and barriers depending on where you're implementing it. Um, but I think the important thing is uh, giving an opportunity um, for people to touch base around solutions and team building. Um, and so that's the one way we've tried to facilitate that. Thank you for, for sharing that, uh, Jenna. And Jenna, I would actually just ask kind of as a follow-up to that, you described the challenge uh, with folks being spread apart geographically. Um, do you have any solutions that you all have, have thought about to try to address that challenge? Uh, well, yeah, we did the typical like, well, have everybody do Skype, you know, or uh, you know, and um, have it be, a, you know, a, a focused topic, and you know, have everybody meet at the same time. Uh, you know, the implementation team is the first Monday at 2 p.m. every time, so that the person can get coverage and travel. And um, so they're they're trying those uh, techniques now. So like, we'll let you know, you know, <laughs> they. Um, right. That, you know, they're all coming together, it, it, but it's different, and I think that was one thing that we acknowledged was like, uh, you know, yeah, you can get some work done in a, in a conference, you know, like this, where we can't all see each other, but we can all hear each other and share those ideas, and so we talked about, you know, just some technical assistance help with setting up a go-to meeting where they could all see the same screen at least, you know, and so they're, they're doing that, and, um, you know, I think that's helping. Right, right. Thank you for, for sharing those uh, potential solutions to that challenge. We also have a, a question that has come in specific to apps, and I see there's some dialogue going on there in the chat box and some links that are being shared um, regarding kind of accessibility to some safety planning apps. And part of that question also was, is there any tracking data um, yet that's been gathered on how many downloads there have been of some of these apps, including um, safety planning and suicide safety um, homes? Anyone have that information to share? We'd have to ask Dr. Stanley about the safety net app. <laughs> uh, as far as the Suicide Safer Homes, uh, we've only had a soft launch, so um, I don't know uh, yet. We've been doing some uh, quality improvement. We decided to make the app accessible um, uh, to all users, and so that put us through another process of uh, quality improvement. So we've just had a soft launch for that. We haven't had a big launch yet. So we've had 50 downloads because that's how many people are invited to view it, basically. OK, great. So as we're coming kind of to our close of our time here for our questions and answers, uh, I just want to kind of open the floor to 
the panelists, and I, I think something that I appreciated from all of you is that you definitely shared encouragement to this community here of folks that are just starting to work on this or have been working on this for some time. So I just want to open it up for kind of any last words of advice from you um, to the folks who, who have been listening in. This is Jan. <clears throat> As I said earlier, if you feel like you hit a brick wall, um, don't feel like that you have to carry that by yourself. Come back to, I mean, there are just some wonderful resources that are being developed. It just seems like almost daily. Um, and some great mentors. Go back to your, uh, particularly your, your SBRC person and say, here's what we're running into. Tell me who to hook up with. And um, you, will, you will just get the best response and um, be able to be connected with people that can really help you with, with what you're doing. This is Jenna. I just wanted to say also about the Suicide Safer Homes app. We have a SurveyMonkey tool um, as a last screen on that app. So when you asked about data, um, we're, we're going to, of course, track how many downloads it gets, but we're also going to um, uh, track information on um, does this make you feel safer or have you changed anything in your home to make your home suicide safer. And so just in our soft launch, like 80% of the people said yes, they would make a change that would make their home safer based on something they learned in the app. So that's just some data to share, an idea. Great. Hi, this is Savannah. Um, I would say what was really uh, very, very helpful to me um, in learning about zero suicide was, again, really um, just taking a couple course concepts and um, seeing how they could be embedded in everything we were already doing in youth suicide prevention or in, say, working age adult or elderly suicide prevention. Um, I, I think some of these components really transcend um, no matter what your maybe specific um, goals might be. And I think the thing that uh, transcends all of it is it really asks us to define who um, are we hoping to care for and what is their um, experience like when they enter whatever system you've chosen. So if you are working in schools, like what is a school, uh, what is a student's experience when they um, are having suicidal thoughts or behaviors within the school, um, who do they maybe go to, um, and you know, is that the counselor or is that the school bus driver? And so then really building your system level uh, pathway or safety care plan around the experience of that patient or client or student or neighborhood. Somebody was talking about um, community-based uh, kind of QPR gatekeeper services, and still I would say um, that my biggest learning and growth has been to define either the area or um, the person that you're hoping to care for. So if it is a community, then literally like get a map out and say that we are going to focus on the people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and that involves all of these zip codes. Um, and that will keep you as a director or organizer or coordinator, um, whatever your role is in suicide prevention, from both um, wasting your resources when we know they're limited and they're not enough, um, and it will keep you focused and uh, afford you that measurable progress that um, you know Jenna and my colleagues have kind of been talking about. Thanks so much, Savannah. Julie, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think just as sort of a, a huge bidding farewell task is, you know, I think in the years, you have, you have several years to carry out the, the activities of the grant, but I think one of the places that you have to start with is really within your own organization or within your partner uh, provider organizations, knowing what the rates of suicide are for those in their care and trying to establish, and I know some of our, our present presenters have already said that, but really trying to establish a metric that you can follow and looking back and what, can, what data can you derive over the last couple of years so you can really begin to see over the next few years what your impact is. Um, Jan, I think, gave such an excellent opportunity to peek into how she was able to do that. I think, you know, we can continue to support you here and, you know, even in a couple of minutes if anybody had a question for, for Jan, because I'll, I'll put you on the spot there, Jan. But 
I think that, you know, there's only a couple of states that I know of who have really done that as comprehensively as Kentucky. And I think you can't go forward in this initiative if you don't know what your, your rates of suicide are. Um, it's really helpful for providers to think about it. And many of them, in many cases, have never thought of it that way. You spent, you know, what, how far out, how far, Savannah was saying this, you know, how far after they've been in your care, what's somebody in care. There's so many definitions, and we can provide some guidance, but to be fair, we don't have sort of the best practice model. We've sort of agreed to go with a model that, that can evolve over time. And if your model differs, that's okay, as long as you continually know what you're comparing your numbers against. But I really do encourage you to think about some of those metrics so that you can um, begin to put those in place now and your provider partners now uh, will be able to find ways to begin to think about that. Thank you, Julie. This is Jenna. I'll just say that we're actually using Jan's model here in Texas um, to uh, do that crosswalk of the um, deaths in our local mental health authority system, in our public mental health system, and in our state hospitals um, within a year of care, and crosswalking that with our vital statistics data. And it's a huge undertaking here in Texas, and there's a lot of people involved, and it's a lot of work. And um, <clears throat> I will say that has been a barrier um, for us. And it's taken uh, since 2012 for us to get as far as we have with even having the sets of data to crosswalk, you know, <laughs> pulled and ready to go and having that permission. And so just uh, my um, urge out there to any other states that are looking at this is to just use that model of JANS and um, just keep having those conversations with people and just revisit it as my recommendation because it took many of those conversations for us to get those permissions and approvals and to get everything lined up of exactly what we're looking at and exactly the data that we need to pull from our system. Um, and then the other side note I will say is that since we chose a county mental health authority, uh, a local community behavioral health center in a county, we were able to pull the county death data and look at their local mental health authority data um, uh, <clears throat> because it's a county and that's how Texas does the vital stats is by county. So um, anyways, uh, we're doing that as well. And it is really exciting when you can look back and see that there has been a, uh, you know, a decrease in the number of deaths. Um, and that is really does make it worthwhile. Mrs. Jan, we, we definitely could not have proceeded um, to go down those roads with the crosswalk had we not had high-level champions on board at the time um, because we, we just couldn't, we could not have pushed that up from the bottom. So gain your champions, you know, find your champions, um, and then start that process of how are we going to know if we've had success. We're not quite to a point yet that we can say everything that we've done has dramatically dropped our suicide rates, but we've got at least we know where we're starting from and are able to get there. And um, there was some pushback from, from some folks. I guess there was even a, how on, a question of, well, how on earth would a community mental health center um, know whether or not you know somebody that was a client had died by suicide, and my answer back was, how? Why would they not know? You know, what can we do? And so, you know, we were just fortunate to have those champions there that actually could open the door to make that happen. But we really didn't realize at the time that it was a, a revolutionary thing. I guess so. Yes, use that model. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Jan, and, and thank you to all the panelists for uh, this great conversation, for answering folks' questions, um, and hopefully this is just the, the beginning of an ongoing conversation. I have a, just a few reminders for us as we come to the end of the webinar. First of all, I really do want to say a, a big thank you to uh, each of the panelists, uh, to Julie, to Jenna, uh, Jan, and Savannah. Thank you all so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and your experience um, with this group and your enthusiasm for the zero suicide approach. As Julie said, you really are uh, leading the charge. So thank you so much for all of your, your good work. Um, for all of those who have joined, um, just a couple of reminders. Um, of course, this webinar is part of your broader uh, training series. And so don't forget that you have some self-paced exercises that you uh, should be completing from January with a focus on zero suicide. And those are actually due the first part of this month. So please don't forget to um, complete those activities and to turn them into your uh, prevention specialist here at SPRC. 
And your prevention specialist will be available, too, on your monthly calls to answer questions that you might have had about this webinar or zero suicide in general. Also, just a reminder, and, and we got this question in the chat, but um, this uh, webinar, along with all of the webinars that have been part of the orientation series, uh, will be on the SPRC website. And you'll receive an email uh, when that, uh, this webinar has been posted. So uh, if you want to watch this again or send this out to other folks who are working on your grant who couldn't make it today, um, that will be there for you. Again, thank you all so much for attending. Um, at, the end, at the close of this webinar, actually, the, you'll be redirected to um, the Zero Suicide website and toolkit. Um, and just a reminder, which Julie did tell you, that it will be changing soon. So please do take some time today to take a look around. But come back in a few weeks as well when the new site is